Well, this morning, our scripture reading comes from Paul's letter, his second letter to the Corinthians. And this is our third out of three sermons about money. It's not everybody's favorite topic to talk about, but Jesus talks about money quite a bit. And Paul took Jesus's teachings on money and specifically applied it to the church. And this example, and and this is not an exhaustive sermon series on money. We could spend weeks and weeks on, on the topic, but uh, we're just hitting some highlights here. And this one, I think, is one of the most significant highlights because the way Paul speaks about giving for the church is so significant. It, it's informative, it's challenging, it's encouraging, and it, it's really rich. And this is why I wanted to, to come to this passage. And we... we chosen, and this is a work of our session, um, we've chosen this topic for these sermons because as people seeking to be faithful followers of Christ, money is one of those key areas where it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of like your dash gauge on the, the, the car of your life as you're driving down the road. It's one of those gauges that tell talk about the health of our life with Christ, how we treat our attitude towards how we use money as one of those gauges. And and I hope that's come out as we looked at these sermons on money from Jesus and the Apostle Paul and what what they are teaching us. And so this is a, a shepherding activity of your session, desiring for our church to be thoughtful about our use and our attitude towards money. Um, and so this is our third and final sermon in this topic, and we're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9. I'm reading just two portions from each. It's a, a longer passage. Obviously, we're just hitting some highlights. We're not touching on all the details. It's rich, but I invite you to stand now as I read God's holy, inerrant, and all-sufficient word. I'll start in chapter 8, reading verses 1 through 7. Paul writes, we want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia, for in a severe testing of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part, for they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and by the and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, See that you excel in this act of grace also. Now coming to chapter 9, verse 6. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness." This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. So in this three-week series, I've been presenting three principles related to our money. And the first principle was called the treasure principle. We saw in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus teaching, very simply, every heart has a treasure. We all have multiple treasures of our heart, and one treasure in particular will rise to be the greatest, most prized treasure of the heart. And as Jesus is teaching this treasure principle, he is warning against 
storing up for yourself treasures here on earth where the moth will destroy and the thieves will break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Jesus is appealing for us to treasure that which is truly valuable. So ultimately, as he comes to teach there in Matthew 6, verse 24, the greatest value, the greatest treasure, the greatest prize, the greatest esteem is God himself. You cannot serve both God and money. That's the treasure principle. Every heart has a treasure. Last week, we came to Paul's teaching in 1 Timothy chapter 6 where we have the the well-known phrase, for the love of money is the root of all evil. But that's part of the warning of Paul. On the flip side, he is inviting the church, Christians, followers of Christ, to invest in that which is truly eternal, that which has, that which is truly life. Invest in these things. And so we have the investment principle. That which you invest in will become your treasure. That which you give your time, your money, your energy, your mental focus, your gifts, your talents, your your energy, that which you invest in will become your treasure. And that's what Paul is making an appeal there in 1 Timothy 6. It says, invest in these things, that which has truly life. Now we come to 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, and this is what I call the abounding principle. It's a word that's repeated throughout these passages about abundance and abounding and this affluence, this overflowing. It's a very simple principle. I'm trying to keep the the principles simple so we remember them, and Lord willing, will allow them to be applicable in our lives. Every heart has a treasure, What you invest in will become your treasure. And the last one is grace abounds to those who treasure God above everything else. Grace abounds to those who treasure God above everything else. And so this is Paul's heart, his passion. He's writing to the church at Corinth. He's on his third missionary journey, and he already has plans to go back to Jerusalem. There's a famine in the land of Judea. He's traveling in the region of Greece right now, and he knows of the famine back in Jerusalem and Judea, and he is receiving a collection, an offering of these churches in, the, in Greek, Greece to bring back to Judea. And the churches of Macedonia, this is Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, you can read about them in Acts chapter 17. The churches in, in Macedonia have given generously to this offering that Paul is bringing back to Jerusalem. And now he is commending to the church at Corinth to do likewise, to do the same thing, to follow in this example. And that's what you have in this instruction in chapters 8 and 9. He is talking about giving, giving specifically to a need amongst the the saints in Judea at Jerusalem. And what we see here, what we're going to draw out from the, the passages I read, we have the example of the Macedonians, and they are begging, begging to be a part of this offering. And he wants the same for the church at Corinth. So this begging is a begging for grace. But then when you come to chapter 9, he begins to get just the nitty-gritty practical. He is inviting the church at Corinth to sow in grace, to sow bountifully, to sow with this sacrificial hope-filled, expectant eagerness of what God is going to give. And then he gives the promise, the promise that we will abound in grace as we trust in the Lord, as we give sacrificially. So that's, that's what we want to look at, begging for grace, sowing in grace, and abounding in grace. If you have a copy of God's word, let's start in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And the, the key verse here, well, multiple key verses. The key word, let me start with that. The key word here is the word grace. 
Let me just highlight where this word comes out in these, these verses. It starts in verse one. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. He wants to talk about how the Macedonians have given abundantly and sacrificially to this offering. But he uses the word grace. That should raise a, a, a a light or a question or a hand in our minds. Like, why would you call that a grace? I want you to know about the grace that has been given among the churches at Macedonia. Why would you call that a grace? What, how's that grace? They're, they're giving. They are giving. How is that grace given to them? But then the second time this word grace comes in is in verse four. And the translation I read is the ESV and they don't translate it as grace but they give the footnote and say, oh, by the way, this is grace. I don't know why they do this, but verse four, they are begging us earnestly for the grace, it says favor, for the grace of taking part in the relief of the saints. It's very explicit. The grace is taking part in the relief of the saints. So they're begging they're begging for this grace. And the grace is giving. Believe it or not, I've not had many people beg to give to a church. There have been some that have been very eager and they want to give and they want it to go well and they, they're, they're eager for that. But the begging, not, not many people have begged. Then he uses the word again in grace in verse six. Accordingly, we've urged Titus that as he has started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. What's the act of grace? It's the Corinthians' participation in the offering. Paul sends Titus ahead before Paul actually goes to Corinth. And Titus is to, to go and gather the, their offerings before Paul even comes. And so he's going there to complete this act of grace among them, that they would participate and give. And the fourth and final time here, this word grace is used in verse seven. As you excel in everything in faith, speech, knowledge, all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. This, just the way Paul frames the whole conversation is very instructive for us. Giving is not a, ne a negative. It is not a burden. It is not something that is viewed in the churches by Paul, by the Macedonians, and he does not want to see the church at Corinth to view it in this way. It is not something of, oh, I guess we better give. The pastor is asking us to give again. No, the pastor is asking you to participate in grace. Complete this act of grace. Excel in this act of grace. Why? That's the, that's the big question. Why? I think now we come to the key verse. <laughs> verse 2. I think this reveals why is grace the appropriate word to frame and think about the act of giving to needs in the church, to saints, to the ministry of the church. Why is it an act of grace? Verse two, Paul says, for in a severe test of affliction, this is the, the Macedonian church, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, in a severe test of affliction, they're being persecuted, they are being attacked. It says, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. You don't put abundance of joy and extreme poverty together as a compound subject. Yeah, I'm talking grammar, but that's what it is. You don't put abundance of joy and extreme poverty together as a a compound subject that overflows in this verbal action of overflowing in generosity on their part. It's just 
mind-blowing. That's not the American way. If you are in extreme poverty, there is a lack of joy. So where does that come from? It comes from these Macedonian believers finding that the true source of joy is not in their money. It's in a relationship with God. It's through a Savior, Jesus Christ, who has reconciled them and brought them back into this right relationship. They have the hope of eternal life. Paul says of the Thessalonica church in chapter 1, verse 8 of 1 Thessalonians, he says, your faith has been proclaimed not only through the regions of Macedonia, but even to the regions of Achaia saying that they have such a delight and joy and hope and confidence in Christ. It's become headline news racing through the regions of of Greece. Like, look at these guys. They're crazy. They love Jesus. They have famous faith. What Paul is saying here is that this generosity of the Macedonians, this generosity, their, their, their eagerness and, and leading to this overflowing act of generosity. Generosity is an outward sign of invisible grace transforming a heart. Catch that? Generosity, a generous spirit, a gracious spirit, a courteous spirit. Spirit. We could throw all kinds of fruit of the Spirit in there, a kind spirit, a loving spirit. But Paul's focus on generosity here. A generous, a generosity, a generous spirit is the outward sign of invisible grace transforming a heart. That's the Macedonian church. Paul wants every believer every church, every follower of Christ to be transformed by the astonishing grace of Jesus Christ. To come to find that in Christ, all your hopes, all your dreams, all your longings, all your desires are satisfied in Christ. That there is no threat in a severe test of affliction. They have an abundance of joy. Once again, oxymoronic in the American context, severe test of affliction equals lack of joy. They have an abundance of joy, an overflowing of joy, an abounding of joy. Not because of their circumstances or hunky-dory. It's not because their bank accounts are big and rich and padded. It's because they have Christ. And it overflows into generosity. Generosity is the outward sign of the invisible grace transforming a heart. Use that as a litmus test for yourself. Your impulses to generosity. Dr. George Sweeting was the president of Moody Bible Institute for a number of years, but I didn't know him in that context. I grew up in the church where he attended and his son was the pastor. And by the time I got to know Dr. George Sweeting, he was a very old, white-haired man, and he's still living to this day, so that means he wasn't very old back then, but, you know, I'm a little kid, and I'm like, man, he's old, he's got all white hair. But he was, he had some of the, the pithiest statements, and that's just not one of my strengths, and so it's one of my weaknesses, but pithy equals really helpful to remember, and they stick with me, here I am. I'm a grown man, 40 years later, remember his statement, never deny a generous impulse. I didn't make it up, George Sweetie. Never deny a generous impulse, why? Because generosity is an outward sign of the invisible grace transforming our hearts. And to deny a generous impulse is to quench the Holy Spirit who might be working in your heart to to be one who's generous. And this is what Paul wants for the church at Corinth. He's, look at the Macedonian church. Look at their example. They, They have been transformed by this astonishing grace and they are generous. It's an outward sign of this inward reality happening. Let's do this at Corinth as well. 
So much more could be said there, but let's continue on going to chapter 9, skipping great passages. Maybe if you're begging for the grace of giving, maybe I'll give more sermons on, <laughs> see if you're begging for grace. No. <laughs> so he talks about Jesus, which is awesome. I'm skipping that, believe it or not. So chapter 9, verse 6, it's kind of the, the summary of Paul's instruction to at Corinth. The point is this. I, I mean, it's, he's surprising. So the church at Macedonia was begging for this grace. He wants the church at Corinth to beg for this grace. And as your pastor, I want you to beg for this grace. I want you to beg for outward signs of the transforming power of grace in your life. And generosity is a mark of that. Now he's going to get practical, sowing in grace. So verse 6, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. This is straight up practical pointers, and there's three that Paul emphasizes here. So I'm going to I'm going to call it grace-empowered generosity. So building off of what we saw in chapter 8, generosity is the outward sign of this inner reality of the the work of grace. So grace-empowered generosity is sacrificial, intentional, and cheerful. Sacrificial, intentional, and sacrificial. Uh, I said that twice then. Cheerful is the third one. So sacrificial, verse six, when he talks about those who sow sparingly, reap sparingly, those who sow bountifully, reap bountifully, he is inviting, he is instructing the church to be sacrificial, to be bountiful in what you sow and what you give and how you pour yourself out. If you're calculated in how you give and you put... Other things first before you give. You're not giving sacrificially. If you look at your income, whether you look at it weekly, monthly, annually, and you look at it and you create your spreadsheet, if that's your thing and you love it, and you're looking at, well, here's my housing expenses, here's my food expenses, here's my kids' activities expenses, if you have kids, if you don't, here's my entertainment expenses, here's my clothing expenses, here's da 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 what, like, ex-nay that, cross out that, subtract that, da, da, da. oh, this is what's left over, this is what we could give to the church, this is what we could give to the ministry of the work of, of Christ. You are not sowing bountifully, you are sowing sparingly. You are putting other things first before this act of giving, of being generous. This is why when the Lord instructs the Israelites in the Old Testament about their offerings to the Lord, he says, set apart the first fruits of your labor. Before you create your spreadsheet, before you calculate all your expenses, before you calculate all that you dream of doing and need to do, to live this life, you set apart first what you are going to give, offer to the Lord. And then with what's remaining, you calculate a budget, how you will live. That's what Paul is commending. This, and, and sacrificially, is he's pushing Christians to think beyond just the calculated precision of, well, we need all of this for this standard of living. I can only give this. What can you sacrifice? What can you give up? What can you go without? So Paul is that calling for sacrificial giving. But then secondly, he says intentional. In verse 7, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. This is an intentional giving. It's not an afterthought. Since the pandemic, we have stopped passing offering plates here at Oak Hills. We've had a box in the back for over two years now for general offering. We've had people ask, even as recently in the last year, even people who attend on a regular basis, where do we give now? We don't make a big deal. It's a box. 
But the Bible calls you to make a big deal. Each one should give. Each one should give as he has decided in his heart. Do you decide in your heart? Do you think about it? Are you thoughtfully planning ahead to give, contribute to the ministry of the church? I could do a whole sermon, and it's a separate sermon. Maybe I should, but I believe the church should be the priority of where you give. Because Jesus promised to build the church. You want to contribute to and, con- and, and be partners with that which Jesus has promised to build. I think the church should be the priority. Parachurch organizations are great. Missionaries are great. But part of the reason why as a church we give to missionaries because we want the church to be the sending agency that And there's a relationship with our missionaries where we are praying for them and supporting them, encouraging them so that they don't have just random individuals, but the church is supporting them. I think the church should be the priority. But you think about it, that's... So sacrificially, intentionally, I mentioned the offering plates just because I remember as a kid, (laughs) my dad was an usher. Um, back when churches had ushers. We don't have ushers here. We have greeters passing bulletins out and things like that. We don't usher you. We don't seat you, but ushers. My dad was an official usher, and he would be passing the plates, and he would get annoyed, and he would let the family know. When he's passing the offering plate, and the offering plate stops in the middle of a row, and somebody's like, oh, I got to get my checkbook out, and I got to sign or fill out a check, he gets annoyed with that because it's slowing up the process of passing the offering plates and he doesn't want to be standing up awkwardly in the row waiting for the offering plate. I mean, that's my dad. I love my dad. Just like John loves his mom. Um, <laughs> that's not intentional giving. That's like, oh yeah, the offering plate's coming. Quick, let's figure out what we're going to give. Give as you have decided in your heart. Make it part of your intentionality. With that, Idea, remembering, generosity is the outward sign, outward evidence of this invisible inner grace transforming your heart. And so as you are planning to give, you pray, Lord, I want to be generous. I want to give sacrificially. I want to put you first. I don't want to trust that my means of money and my income help me, Lord, that's, that's intentionally doing what you're deciding in your heart beforehand. Part of that is, as we had in our call to worship, and this stands out in my mind, we just taught in Kid 360 the catechism question, what is prayer? And our kids know it. It's from Psalm 62, 8. Prayer is the pouring out, and this is my action, pouring out your heart to God. We had that as our call to worship and so when you're making a decision in your heart, your, your heart is a place where you're pouring out your heart to God. So even as you're deciding to give, you're praying, asking the Lord to help. But third, he says, cheerful, for God loves a cheerful giver. It's not begrudging. It's not grumpy. It's not bemoaning. And my friends, when the Bible commands emotion, And that's an emotion. The Bible does command emotion. In our therapeutic age, we want to just kind of dismiss our emotions like, well, that's just, that's just me. That's my emotions. I have no control over that. That's, that's our therapeutic age. That's not biblical. The Bible says you ought to control your emotions. How do you do that? You submit your heart to the Lord and allow him to shape and influence your emotions. So when Paul commands the church at Philippi, rejoice in the Lord, rejoice always. That's Thessalonians 5, sorry. He says it in Philippians 4. Um, be joyful always. He, he, how, how, do you, how do you control joy? You don't, but God does. And you submit your heart and ask, Lord, make me a cheerful giver. You delight in those who are cheerful givers. I don't give cheerfully. Change my heart, O oh Lord. And that's a work of grace. 
in your life. And as you see that cheerfulness grow, you have all the more reason to delight in it and celebrate and praise God. Lord, you are at work in my life. It's something I can never produce. I have some statistics here. These statistics are, I, I read just to, as tools to help you gauge your giving. Do you give sacrificially, intentionally, and cheerfully? Here at Oak Hills, we practice uh, where, I, I guess it's a principle, it's a guideline. I do not know what anybody gives here at Oak Hills. Our elders do not know. I'll be honest, there's a part of me that questions that. It's like, well, how do I hold accountable the sheep that I'm called to shepherd and lead? I, I don't know what you give. I don't know what you make, your income. I don't know your life circumstances totally about your finances. I don't pry into that. I don't know your, your credit card debt and your mortgage and school debt, or whatever. I, I don't, we don't, I don't know, is that an American thing or, or what? That's, just trying to be respectful, don't want to pry too much. And so I'm going to read some stats that might be feeling like they're prying, but I'm just saying up front, I don't know. <laughs> so number one, this is from a, some reputable sources. <laughs> like, I didn't make these up. It's from a website. I found it on the interweb. I could give you sources later. Tithers, those who give money to the church, and the, and the tithe is a technical term of giving 10% of your income. It's not commanded in the New Testament. Tithers only make up 10 to 25% of any congregation. You might ask, well, how about Oak Hills? I don't know. <laughs> Our... Financial Secretary Jerry Owens does know what you give. She tracks that for tax purposes. She gives you a report on an annual basis. And she gives a report to, to me and the elders that just is nameless and generalized, talking about giving units. And that sounds so sterile, but the, the, the phrase is about most married couples or families give as one singular unit. So we don't count giving by individuals, but by giving units. And here at Oak Hills, we have 32 giving units. So if you're looking around, how many families are in our church? 40 to 45 call our church home. So that's higher than 10 to 25%. So I think Oak Hills is doing good, but I don't know what level the giving is at. So number two, this is an interesting fact. Eight out of 10 people who give to churches have zero credit card debt. That's uh, something that the gauge our American lifestyle loves, credit card debt. You're, you're going to fight inflation by spending on your credit card. Go for it. It's not healthy, and it actually is a negative impact on your giving life. And so if you're wondering, I don't give that much. That's one area, perhaps. I've never asked anybody ever what kind of credit card that, that they have. Some people have freely offered that, but I'm not asked. Um, I'll skip that one. This one. I'm, try I'm running out of time. I got half a sermon still. On average, Christians give 2.5% of their income to churches. How's Oak Hills doing? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you, you look at the stats of Johnson County. I live in Johnson County. It's one of the wealthiest counties of America. I know you're not all in the, the upper crust of Johnson County, but they say the median household income in Johnson County, that's teaching my kids fifth grade math. Median is that mi middle number. It's not the average. The average is different. The median household income here in Johnson County is $96,000 a year. And some of you are above that and some of you are below that. 
but the median is in the middle. The average is $127,000 a year. Average income in Johnson County. That's because there's a lot of people way up there. Not here, right? So why, why do I mention that? If, if we are, I don't know. I don't know your income. If we are average for Johnson County, our median uh, income of our congregation should be $96,000. I don't know. If everybody gave 10%, then we won't go there. Based upon our annual income at our church and that median income, our giving units give on average about 7%. That's the extent I know the numbers. So I'll say this. Oak Hills has always been very generous and very, and we've been blessed. And I, I would say that there is a work of grace shown through the generosity of our church. But Paul's command in 2 Corinthians 8, 7 is excel in this grace. And I know my own heart and my own life, I do not excel in this grace. I think this is interesting. I do want to read this. And this is probably another sermon. Let's talk about generations. We like talking about generations. Boomers, you know who you are. Boomers make up 30% of the U.S. population. They make up 42% of the donor population. It's not the amount that's given. It's just the, the number of people giving. They make up beyond their population. Gen X, that's me, if you're wondering. We make 27% of the population, and we only make up 19% of the donor population. Millennials, where are you? You are 30% of the population and you only make up 7% of the donor population. Now, I have speculations about that. I think some of us get caught up in the, the belief that I'll, I'll give when I have a better income. I'll give when I've arrived. I'll give once my kids are out of the house. I'll give once all the schooling's paid off. I'll give, we, we put all these stipulations. But I tell you, the habits of your heart, that's what we're talking about here, this treasure principle, the habits of your heart will become more and more ingrained and, and, and set in stone the longer you put it off. One of the things that we have encouraged our own kids and one of the things that was pressed upon me is you don't wait to give until X, Y, Z, fill in the blank, you arrived at something. You build that habit because it is a, a discipline of seeking and honoring the Lord first and foremost in your heart. So, do you give sacrificially, intentionally, and cheerfully? Paul doesn't stop there, and I think this is the beauty of the gospel. Paul comes to the blessings of God. This is why giving is a grace. This is why giving is something that you beg for. This is why you desire to be part of that. Verse eight, he says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. In the Greek, it's just, you, you hear it in English, but in the Greek, it's all the more prominent, this all times and all ways that in all things you may abound in all good work. It, it's just trying to emphasize the, the fullness of it. It's complete. It's not, there's no anything left out of all. He's able to, to make all grace abound to you. What is all grace? 
They're saving graces. He gives you faith through the Holy Spirit. He reconciles you to the Father. He, you have the redemption out of sin. You're set free from sin. And you have the hope and promise of eternal life and the forgiveness of your sins. Those are saving graces. God is able to make all saving grace abound to you. But then there's also what I would call attitudinal graces. Things like hope and peace and joy and contentment. These attitudes of how we respond and react to the circumstances and situations of our lives, God is able to make all these attitudinal graces abound to you because your heart is being shaped and shifted and transformed so that these outward circumstances do not dictate your joy, but your relationship with God does. He is able to make all these attitudinal graces abound to you. But then there's also productive graces. Productive graces are spiritual gifts the energy and strength to serve and the sacrifice and the grace to give generously is a productive grace. God is able to make all these graces abound to you. And Paul makes his argument by quoting from Psalm 112. It says in verse nine, as it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Perhaps at first reading, without any reference, you hear that pronoun he and you think it's God. But you go to Psalm 112, verse 9, where it's quoting, and it's not God. It's the one who fears the Lord. He is the one who distributes freely and gives to the poor, and his righteousness endures forever. What Paul is doing, by quoting this one verse, he is drawing the minds of the readers to think about the Psalms, where it's from. And Psalm 111 and 112 are connected. They're both acrostic Psalms. They're the, the ABC of the Hebrew alphabet for memorization. And Psalm 111 celebrates how great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. And it's a, a recounting, Psalm 111, of all the great works of the Lord. Ending with the phrase, about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And then Psalm 112 opens up, how blessed is the one who fears the Lord. Describes this person who fears the Lord. Well, what the logic of these Psalms is that those who delight themselves in the Lord, those who fear the Lord, those who draw their strength from the Lord become transformed and renewed so that they are a conduit of the blessings and the grace from God to those around them. And Paul cherry picks that one verse and it says, God is able to make all graces abound to you just like this person in the Psalm 112. He feared the Lord and the Lord abounded graces to him so that he distributed freely, gave to the poor and his righteousness endures forever. He could do the same for you. He can make you a generous, abundant, overflowing person to bless people around you. God wants you to be a conduit of his grace to the people you come in contact with. And it's that grace that brings true joy and satisfaction. I don't think there's a promise here of abundant wealth. If you give more, you're going to be richer. I don't think that's Paul's promise here. I think what Paul is promising is when you trust the Lord, when he becomes your greatest treasure, when you fear the Lord, when he is the one that you esteem, this, this abounding principle, grace abounds to those who treasure God above all else. You will find in your life Perhaps not wealth and riches and comfort according to the American dream, but you will find the greatest joy, the greatest hope, the greatest satisfaction, and you'll see yourself being used as a conduit, a blessing to the people around you, and God will be delighted to shine his glory upon you. It's when we try to hoard things for ourselves and protect our own security by our own means, we are cutting off our opportunities to be used as a blessing for others. God says, let it go. 
Release it and trust that I am able to make all grace abound to you. So when we cling, we limit the grace of God in our lives. So, three brief sermons. They haven't been very brief. I know, they're long. Three longer sermons. Should have been six. How are you doing with your money? Your heart has a treasure. What is your treasure? What you invest in will become your treasure. You can evaluate your life. What are you investing in? And the invitation, the, the allure, the promise there, God will make his grace abound to you when you treasure him above all things. Let me pray for us. Gracious God, help us, Lord. You desire this grace to grow in us. You desire us to excel in this grace in such a marvelous way because it is a blessing and a gift and a comfort and encouragement. Lord, help us not to set our hope on the uncertainty of riches, but help us to set our hope on you alone, for you are the source of life and joy and peace. And so, Lord, may we demonstrate outward evidences of your grace working in our hearts through our generosity. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.